All right, this last week we took 17 kids and four adults to kids camp. And it was my little girl's, uh, little girl Elena's first time at kids camp ever. And it was an interesting time at kids camp. Because the camp we went to was uh, Seneca Lake Baptist Assembly Camp in Senecaville, Ohio, just east of here. And uh, it was very nostalgic for me. Because it was the camp that I grew up at when I was a teenager. It was the first camp I ever went to. And uh, walking on the same camp paths and sitting in the same places uh, where I remember as a teenager, listening to God's Word being taught to me uh, by very interesting and excited teachers. Uh, and remembering God's voice that still small voice speaking to my heart about my life and about what he wanted me to do with my life. Brought back a, a lot of really, really good memories. I want you to know that we should always, as a church, promote and send kids to kids camp and to teen camp also, which we'll be uh, working on for next year. Uh, but God does tremendous work in the lives of children when they can get somewhere and focus on God and focus on spiritual things and just get quiet. Um, my daughter told me, Daddy, I didn't even realize that there weren't TVs at that camp until I got home. I said, well, that's fantastic. We're moving in. Um, I got to do something at camp that I've always wanted to do um, and never had the guts to do it. I got to steal a golf cart at camp. I did. I wanted to do it when I was a teenager, but I had to wait until I was 40 years old to do it. I was in the cafeteria, and I was reading. It was midnight. We'd send all the kids to bed, and Kevin and the other counselors had the cabin tied down. I'm sitting there in the cafeteria by myself reading and just spending some time with the Lord, and, and there's a knock on the cafeteria door, and a lady counselor comes in. And she says, I'm looking for the nurse. One of my kids is having convulsions. And I thought, oh, this is not a nice problem to have at midnight. Uh, so I get up. I said, I have no idea where the nurse is at. But I'm going to help you look for her. And she said, oh, thank you so much. And so we, we're, we walk up to the nurse's door and, and knock. And no answer. There's no answer at all. And we get a little bit nervous. And, and there's a sign on the door. It says the nurse is in the cafeteria. The cafeteria is like a half a mile away. And I'm thinking of this girl in her cabin having convulsions. And I'm thinking, we don't have much time at all. And I didn't see anyone else out on campus at all. And so we turn around to start uh, trekking over to the, to the sanctuary where the, where the uh, sign said the nurse was. And there were two golf carts sitting there. And I thought, please, Lord, let there be keys in one of these golf carts. And there was. And I happily got into that. And this lady counselor got in. And uh, we drove off of the, you had to go off the, uh, the camp into a different area uh, uh, down the road. And so we, we took a right on the golf cart. And we're riding down. And, uh, and there was this big ditch in the road. It was like three feet deep. And I thought, There's, this cart's never going to go there. But there was a, a truck pulled up uh, in front of the ditch, in front of us, with a, a trailer with the, the gate down. And I looked at that gate and I thought, that's perfect, I've seen this before somewhere. And I hit the gas, and I hit the ramp, and I heard in the sky, and I hit the landing, oh wait, no, no, I jumped off the real story and into my dream sequence. No, be, everything before the ditch was true. So leave the ditch, and we, we went to the sanctuary, and we looked for the nurse. No nurse there, where the sign said she was. So we got back in. We came back to the camp, and the, the gates to the camp had been closed. We couldn't get back onto campus. And there was rocks and ditches, so we're, we're just worried sick about this, this girl in there. And, uh, and I finally found a little hole to get the, the cart through, and uh, one of the teenage workers at the camp, a summer worker, was driving by. 
uh, Mr. Tan, um, he's one of the lifeguards there, and he took, he took the, uh, the counselor back to the cabin, and then there, he called the nurse, and the nurse pulled up, and, and I parked the, the, go, the golf cart, and uh, she said, hurry, get on the golf cart, you might be able to help me, and I'm thinking, what is going on here, this is a crazy night. And so we drove back to the cabin, and, and they got the girl taken care of. And I think it was just some kind of stomach thing or something. Uh, but I was Batman for the last night of camp. And I just wanted to tell you that story. <laughs> camp is awesome. If you have kids, send your kids to camp. If you haven't been a chaperone at camp, think about coming next year. I double dog dare you. All right. I want you to turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 27. And there was a point to the camp story. We had uh, six kids make salvation decisions at camp this year. And God worked in people's hearts, and even the hearts of adults that, that, were, that were there at camp. So we appreciate your prayers very much. We're going to start in verse 27. I want to talk today about the, really the thing that changed the lives of the kids that went to camp and mine when I was there also. It says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the common hall and gathered him, the whole band of soldiers, and they stripped him and put on him a scarlet robe. And when they had plated a crown of thorns, they put it upon his head and a reed in his right hand and They bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spit upon him and took the reed and smote him on the head. And after they had mocked him, they took the robe off of him and put his own raiment on him and led him away to crucify him. And as they came out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name, and him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they were come into the place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull, they gave him vinegar to drink, mingled with gall, and when he tasted thereof, he would not drink. And they crucified him, and parted his garments, casting lots, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet. They parted my garments among them, and upon my vesture did they cast lots. And sitting down, they watched him there. And set up over his head the accusation written, This Jesus, the King of the Jews. And there were two thieves crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads and saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. I want you to open up in prayer. God, I thank you so much for this day. And God, we just read the passage in the Bible that is the turning point of all of human history. And if anyone in this room is to see the kingdom of heaven and they leave this life, I pray that by the end of the day they would understand that this passage they read must be the turning point in their life. God, we thank you so much that you loved us so perfectly that you sent Jesus to die for us. Help us to remember the sacrifice you made for us. The deep compassion you had to send him to suffer innocently for us who were not innocent. Thank you for the cross and all that it means to us. And I ask that you'd open our eyes today so we get into your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You need to know that the Bible teaches that Christianity is a bloody religion. Do you know that? Uh, the cross is a very familiar symbol to us here in America, I think. But if you think about it for a minute... It, we shouldn't feel really comfortable about having a cross as a symbol. Uh, if you wore a cross as a symbol, 
back in Jesus' day, that would kind of be the same as walking around with uh, an electric chair on your necklace. Today, it's a symbol, a method of execution. It's a symbol of death. Not only death, but the goriest, most painful, humiliating death that mankind has ever thought of. The Romans perfected a method of execution that was the epitome of all methods of execution. It was meant as a great deterrent for the worst of the worst. And that's what Jesus took for us. The cross means a lot of things for us. You know, the cross is the center of our worship. It's the center of our lives. It's the center of the purpose of everything we are and, and why God saved you. If you do not understand and if you are not intimately familiar with what the cross means for your life, then you're missing out on the great power and the great meaning of what, Christian, of what Christianity is. The cross means everything. The cross accomplished a lot for us. Jesus Christ here in this passage died on a cross. And He accomplished a lot of things for us. I want you to understand if you're in this room that without this event in history happening, there would be no chance for anybody in the world to get to heaven and escape hell. This is the primary reason Jesus came to die on a cross so that you could go to heaven. Because left to your own goodness and righteousness, you would be going straight to hell. The Bible says without Christ, that's the destiny of everybody. But Jesus Christ changes that destiny when you meet Him and put your trust in Him for your salvation. There's a point in time that has to come in your life where you do that. I want to talk about some things real fast that Jesus accomplished on the cross for us. One of the things He did was He became a substitution for us. When Jesus was on the cross, He was a substitution. He suffered the payment for our sins instead of us. He took our place. Do you remember what the first sacrifice in the Old Testament was? Someone say, what was the first sacrifice? It was a lamb. That's right. After Adam and Eve sinned, all the way back in the beginning of human history, Adam and Eve sinned and they hid from God because that sin separated them from God. Their eyes were opened and they understood that they were sinful and shameful. But God didn't let them stay hidden Thankfully, God went after them even though He had known what they did and they had changed the whole course of human history with their disobedience, with breaking God's law. And people say, well, why did God have to do that? All He did was take a bite of a piece of fruit. Well, it wasn't the size of the command that mattered. It was the size of the commander that mattered. And they rejected God's law just like we reject God's law in our lives today. The Bible says that each one of us has rejected God's law and shaken our fist at God. And when Adam and Eve sinned, God found them, and He provided a covering for them. He Himself slew a lamb. It was the first blood that was ever shed. And He used the skin of that lamb to give them coverings. There were coverings. And that first sacrifice is a picture of Jesus. That lamb became a substitute for Adam and Eve. And Jesus became a substitution for you because you are the one that deserved to die on the cross. You're the one that deserved to take all of the punishment, but He became a substitute for you. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That means physically and spiritually and eternally. So how did His death pay an eternal price? If hell is eternal... If I deserve, deserve eternal punishment, then how did what Jesus did? Because Jesus died, right? But he, he, he was only dead for three days. He rose again from the dead. If He was only dead three days, how did He pay the eternal price for my sins? Well, here's the reason. Jesus is eternal. His death 
for those few days was enough to pay the price for your sins. Because He's the eternal God. What Jesus did on the cross was a reversal of the curse. It was a perfect sacrifice. Jesus died on the cross to be a substitution for you. To take your place. There was a little boy that was walking with his dad and his older brother. And uh, they were walking through the woods. And this giant bumblebee came out of the woods. And the little boy was scared to death. And he had right to be because he was allergic to, to bees. And uh, the little boy started running around his dad. And his dad was swatting. And uh, the kid was scared to death. And his older brother grabbed him and wrapped himself around the little boy. And the bee stung his older brother. Because his older brother knew that he wasn't allergic to stings. So he took the place of his brother. He took the sting from the bee. And I want you to know that if you're in this room and you don't know Jesus Christ, that's exactly what Jesus Christ did for you. He became a substitute for you. He took the punishment. He took the sting of sin. The sting of sin is death. You all know we're going to die. The death rate's 100%. And after this death, then the judgment. So how are you going to face that? The only way you can face that is if you have the substitute. If Jesus took the death of sting from you, which is why he died on the cross, then he's your substitute. You have a substitute for yourself. He took your place, even though he didn't have to. Another thing he did is... He died on the cross for our redemption. He made a payment for the price of your sin to free you from bondage. That's what redemption is. If there's a slave, if someone was to free him from slavery, you had to pay a redemption price. And Jesus on the cross paid a price. He paid something to exchange something for another thing. He exchanged his life for your freedom. In our case, it was freedom from sin. Listen to the things the Bible says that we're redeemed from. In Titus 2.14, says that we're redeemed from all iniquity. In Galatians 3.13, it says that we're redeemed from the curse of the law. We're redeemed from the power of sin. In Romans 6.18, we're redeemed from death, from hell, from evil, destruction, from the hand of the enemy. You had to be bought and paid for. Why? Because you are a slave to sin. All of us were slaves to sin and slaves to the devil. Um, if you ever are on internet chat boards, people like to throw the word Hitler and Antichrist around a lot. If you have an opinion on anything and you post it, uh, it, it doesn't matter what you believe about what. Someone will call you Hitler or the Antichrist eventually. People have weird ideas uh, about the Antichrist uh, and who the Antichrist is, I believe the Bible teaches it's a particular person. But you know, the Bible also teaches that everybody who doesn't know Christ has a spirit of Antichrist in them. Because if you're not for Christ, if you're not on his side, then you're on the opposite side. Because the Bible says that there's only two types of people in the world, and he had to buy you back from the other side. You belong to the other side. And he paid for you with his death. Think of all the things that you're enslaved to because of your sin. Look at all the ways people are trapped all around us. I don't know how many conversations I've had with people about the drug problem and Logan and the, the alcohol problem that happens. And, and you see families falling apart all over the place. Why is that? It's because people are slaves to sin. And we're all slaves to sin. It's not just people with those particular problems, but those are the most obvious ones to us, aren't they? They're the ones that all society recognizes. Well, God recognizes a lot more sins than just those sins. We're slaves to sin and in order to be free from it. You had to be paid for. That's what Jesus did on the cross. That's one of the many things. He paid to redeem you. Another thing he did is he died on the cross for your reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 21 says this, and listen. Now all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. Not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. This is an awesome word. It's a, it's a theology word. Reconciliation. And the way theologians use it. It's, it's the, the mending of a relationship. 
a relationship that was once at enmity, at odds. You were an enemy of God, the Bible teaches. And if you're in here and you're a Christian, you were reconciled to God. Jesus Christ brought you back together with Him. He created you, but the bond was broken. The relationship was broken, and Jesus died on the cross to reconcile you to Himself, to bring you back together. It's a wonderful thing when people are reconciled. But Jesus paid for the greatest reconciliation that ever took place. The Bible says that sin causes hostility between us and God. Reconciliation, though, is offered to everybody. But not all receive it. It has to be received. It's like if you were to reconcile with a friend that you had a falling out with. You would have to agree to the reconciliation, wouldn't you? It would have to be received. And salvation is the same way. God offers reconciliation to you. He offers you a relationship with Him. And all you have to do is believe in His Son to have that. And if you say no to Him, there's no chance for you to be reconciled. But He loves you and died for you. So why not be reconciled to God? Another thing Jesus did on the cross, and I, I know this is a big theology word, and I don't usually like on Sunday morning using big theology words, but you're going to learn this one, because I love it. It's propitiation. Say it with me. Propitiation. Propitiation is the satisfying of the wrath of God. Listen to this verse. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. I had no idea what that word meant until I went to Bible school. Propitiation means this. That Jesus satisfied the wrath of God against you. You need to understand if you're in here. And you're not a believer. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the Bible says that you're an enemy of God and his wrath hangs over your head. There's already judgment against your sin. And you're under that judgment. And you can't do anything to get out from under that judgment. There's no way for you to. You can't be good enough. You can't be moral enough. But Jesus Christ died to satisfy that wrath of God. He deflected it away from you by having it pointed to Himself. He did that for you because He loves you. He he is the propitiation for our sins. He accomplished that on the cross. God treated Jesus the way I should have been treated in order that I can be treated the way Jesus should have been treated. That's what Jesus did for you. He didn't deserve any of that, but He took it from you so that you could be treated the way He deserves to be treated. How awesome is Jesus Christ? How much does He love you? I can't describe how perfectly God loves you today. Maybe you're sitting in there in this room and you've never heard that before. I've met people that have never heard the words, Hey, God loves you. I want you to know today, God loves you. More than anyone can ever describe. The best thing that describes God, God's love for you is an image of a cross in your mind. Another thing that Jesus died on the cross for was for your justification. Justification means that you were made and declared righteous in the sight of God. See, Jesus is, he didn't just wipe your sins away when you became a Christian. He wiped your sins away and put all of the righteousness of Christ inside of you. He gave you Jesus Christ's goodness. So when he sees you, he sees the perfection of Christ. What a wonderful gift. It's good enough just to have your sins forgiven, isn't it? Isn't it good enough when when someone just forgives you? Boy, that feels fantastic. But he did more than that. He put positive in your bank account. Not just took the negative balance away. So what does this mean that Jesus did all this for us on the cross? This means everything. Everything has to change. It means everything's backwards now. You know the things Jesus taught is completely different and backwards from what the world teaches? The world teaches it's the dog-eat-dog world, right? You need to sip on everyone, even your grandma's head, to get to the top. Jesus teaches exactly the opposite of that. Instead of cursing those who curse you, Jesus, no, 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 you bless those people. If someone curses you, you bless them. 
If someone forces you to give them their tunic, then you give them another one too. If they make you go a mile, then you go an extra mile. Jesus taught exactly the opposite of what the world teaches. The world teaches to hate your enemies. And Jesus said, no, no, no. Love your enemies. He didn't say just ignore them. He said love them. Do you see the difference? That's a big difference. Most people think you're a good person if you just ignore your enemies. Jesus said, no, that's not enough. My standards are a little bit higher than that. His standards are backwards from the world's. If you live the way Jesus tells you to live, you're going to be going against the stream. Because that's what Jesus taught. So one of the things, one of the applications I can learn from looking at the cross, one of the things that I need to understand when I realize what Jesus did is, number one, is that I can no longer live for myself. If I'm a Christian, I'm dead now. And a new life has begun. You're about to see a picture of what this is in the baptisms you're about to see. A kid standing out of water, then going down underneath the water and being brought up again. It's a picture of Jesus dying and then being raised to new life. The Bible teaches that's what happens to you when you get saved. So you have to die to your old life. That old life has to be buried and killed. When you get saved, that happens and you get raised up into a new life. Jesus gives you new life. That's what Christianity is about. That's why Jesus said that you must be born again. You cannot see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. It's that new life that Jesus gives you. It's not just a religious decision you make. It's a supernatural change that God makes inside of you. You need to understand that. People make religious choices all the time. There are people that join the Mormon church and and, and the people that join Islam and people that join Catholicism. You can't just join what this book teaches like that. It's not just deciding, I want to be a cultural Christian. I want things around me to be Christian. No, you have to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Because he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And you can be sitting here looking as Baptist as you can look. And be headed straight to hell. Being Baptist and sitting at church isn't what saves you. You need to be born again. And because of what Jesus did, I can't live for myself anymore. I'm dead. The new life's begun. It's sort of like when you get married. You know what happens when you get married? You die! In a way. You die to your old life, don't you? My old single life is gone. I'm dead to that now. So all the throngs of ladies chasing after me. I'm dead to them! There's no other options for me. I'm settled. My old... uh, (coughs) Non-single life is over. I have a new life now. A better one. When you become a Christian, your old single life dies and you get married to him and your life becomes better if you think you die when you get married wait till you have kids your life really dies then (laughs) you don't have time for anything I need to be careful what I say I tell people Melissa is my my trophy wife and she says that I'm her consolation prize God said, here's what you get for playing. Thanks for coming. Matthew 16, 24 says, Then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I want you to listen to this quote. Because a lot of things people teach about Christianity is all about filling your selfish desires. If you go into a Christian bookstore nowadays, you'll see all kinds of self-help stuff. Self-help, help me, help me improve, get me to the next step. I want to do this. I want... And it's all focused on me. Aren't Christian books supposed to be focused on God? You know, when you focus on God, that's when your life really improves. See, that's the paradox in what Jesus taught. If you lose your life for his sake, that's when you'll find it. 
But if you try to save your life, what happens? You lose it. It's the paradox. It's like the pearl of great price. If you find a pearl in a field, you go and sell everything you have to get that pearl. Why? Because it's more valuable than anything you have. And Jesus Christ is more valuable than anything anyone in this room has. Why are you hanging on to trash? Instead of getting him. Well, this is why. People don't want to sell the garbage they have. And get the pearl. The pearl is free. All you got to do is lay down your junk. The pearl is free. He gives it to you as a gift. But it means I'm not living for myself anymore. I'm dead. The new life started. Listen to this quote from A.W. Tozer. He said, The old cross slew men. The new cross entertains them. The old cross condemned. The new cross amuses. The old cross destroyed confidence in the self. And the new cross encourages it. The kind of Christianity that's taught today, I think, resembles that remark that it takes Christianity and what Jesus and the Bible teaches and and it's all about self. Listen, you, you don't even know who you are unless you're focused on Him and your life's given over to Him. But we need to die to our old life before you start the real thing. The next thing I need to understand because of the cross is I have a sure expectation of eternal life. And this is the one of the greatest gifts you can have as a Christian. To know that God never leaves you. He never forsakes you. He doesn't lose anybody that He puts into His hand. I talk to so many people who have been abandoned, even by people who are supposed to be the most trustworthy. People who have been abandoned by their mothers and their fathers. And I can't even contemplate doing that. But there are kids who experience that. I, I wonder... How can they trust anyone? How can they believe that any real love exists? If you go through that, how can you believe what anyone says? But the Bible says that God will never leave you or forsake you. That's what Jesus said. David said, even though my mother and father forsake me, the Lord will not. The Lord will not. You know what's great? I have a sure expectation of eternal life. I'm not saved because I'm anything or because I'm anything good. I'm saved because he saved me and I trusted him. That's it. Jesus saved me. I have a sure expectation of it. First Thessalonians 5 says, God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as you also do. So we're comforted and we're edified. We're built up with the truth that God will never forsake me or abandon me. He has saved me and put his mark on me. And I have the sure expectation of eternal life. No matter who leaves you, no matter who has left you, Jesus Christ is faithful. He's faithful. And He can teach you faithfulness. So you can have faithfulness in your life. And in your family. But He's the source of it. Another thing, because of the cross, I have to see all people in the light of the cross. When you become a Christian, you don't see things the same anymore. It's impossible to. You can't meet the person that created it Everything in the universe with his word. You can't meet this person personally and stay the same. Your life has to change. And one of the things that changes is the way you treat people. Why? Because this has to do with most of the commandments in the Bible. Did you know that? Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. So if you meet the God who made those rules... You can't continue to treat people the same way. Your life has to change. We have to see people in the light of the cross. He says, I know and I am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in and of itself, but to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it's unclean. For if because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Listen to this point of the verses right here. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. 
You know what he's saying? Don't harm your brothers and your sister for anything, even something insignificant. Why? Because Christ died for them. How do I need to view people when I leave this church, when I go to work? I need to view them as someone that Christ died for. How do you need to view your brothers and sisters in this church? You need to view them as someone that Christ died for. When you mistreat a person, whether it's a brother or a sister or a stranger outside, and that's someone that Jesus loves so much that he let his flesh be torn off of his bones for that person, how does God view you? When instead of treating people with love like he commands, like he gave to you, he sees you cursing people, living in hatred and spite. You can't continue to live that way if you're a Christian. I have to see all people in the light of Christ, and in the light of his cross. Listen to what Oswald Chambers says about the cross. All heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. All hell is terribly afraid of it while men are the only beings who are more or less ignorant of its meaning. If you don't want to be ignorant of the meaning of the cross, take a look at how you treat people. What's your life about? Is it all about you and serving yourself and and getting ahead and getting what's yours? Or are people a focus of your life? Because Jesus died on the cross, He died for every single person. Whatever race or color or ethnicity or social part of the stratus that you come from, when you mistreat somebody, you need to understand you're mistreating somebody that Jesus died for. This is why you need to be very careful how we treat people. I have to be careful how I treat people. Some people are hard to treat nicely, aren't they? Some people are jerks. It doesn't matter. We're supposed to love them anyways. Sometimes I'm a jerk. I remember one time when I was probably being short-tempered with Melissa and we were bickering. She walked away and said, I'm going to tell God on you. (laughs) I got out of that argument quick. I know God loves her. But that's how he sees everybody. Another thing, because Jesus died on the cross, I'm dead to my sin. I'm dead to myself. Listen, if you want to be free from all the things that hold you down and and destroy your life, you need to understand that the only freedom from sin and, and, and from your sinful nature and from the things that try to destroy your life, the only thing that can free you is the cross of Christ. Because when you come to Christ, you become dead to your sin. It doesn't have power over you anymore. You have the choice at that point, at the point you become a Christian, to say no to the things that destroy you and hurt your life and hurt your family. He gives you the ability to be dead to sin. In Romans 8, 10, it says, If in Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. He makes you alive so that you're no longer a slave to sin. If you sin as a Christian, I've got some news for you. The devil didn't make you do it. You're doing it just because you like it. And you're paying the consequences for it every day. But why? You don't have to. You're not a slave to it anymore. You can tell it no. He gave you the power to do that in Christ. You have access to that. You know, Corinthians says that there's no temptation that's come upon you except which is common to man. And God will provide a way of escape whenever you face temptation. You know what that means? It means every time you sin, it's just your fault. You can't blame the devil or your wife or your husband. It's your fault when you sin. Why? Because you have the power as a Christian in Christ to say no to sin. To not let sin hurt you and destroy your life. And that's why God tells you not to do it anyways. Because he cares about you. He doesn't want your life hurt and destroyed. But I'm dead to sin like a zombie. Now zombies are non-responsive because they're dead. If a zombie's coming after you and you hit it with a baseball bat, it just keeps trying to come and eat your face. Have you ever seen a zombie movie? Why? Because they're dead. And that's how we're like to sin. When sin starts coming at us and we get tempted, we need to be dead to it. We run right to Christ. The Bible says we need to resist temptation. We need to say no to temptation. We have the ability to because Christ freed us from it. He freed us from it. The last thing is this. Because of the cross, I must view everything in the world 
and everything that happens to me in this world in the light of the cross. The cross of Jesus Christ was the center point, the focal point of all of human history. Everything hinges on it. It was predicted in the book of Genesis. It was fulfilled in the New Testament. And it's going to culminate in the glorification of every single person who has ever trusted Jesus Christ as their Savior before. And Revelation tells us about that. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore we're seeing... We also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily besets us. And let us run with patience the race that's set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endureth such con- contradiction of sinners against himself, lest he be wearied and faint in your minds." He says, we look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. What did he do on the cross? He endured it. Why? Because it brought him joy to. Why? Because he loves you. And he wants you to be in heaven forever with him. That's why he died for you. Do you reject his offer today? Every man and woman is making a choice. There's an offer being made. A deal. And you're the great benefactor of the deal. Be salvation's a free gift. But you have to believe in him. You have to turn away from your sins and accept his gift of eternal life. Jesus died to save you. Don't miss the only way to get to heaven. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes for a minute. As our singers come up, I want to also ask those who are being baptized to go to the places you've been instructed to. And there will be people to help you out in those places. If you're in this room today... And you can say, Mike, if I were to die right now in my chair, I know a hundred percent that I would go to heaven when I die. I know where I would go. I know I would go to heaven. Because Jesus died for me and I have met him. I have a relationship with him. I trusted him as my savior and he gave me new life. So yes, Mike, if I were to die in my chair right now, I would, I would go to heaven. I know it's not because I'm good, but I, he gave it to me. You can answer affirmatively to that 100%. You know 100%. I want you to lift your hands up and slip it down. Lift your hands up and slip it down. And listen, if you've ever accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, that's what He did for you. He saved you. If you're not sure about that, even though you've done that, I want to encourage you to get into the Bible. Find out what it says about what God did for you when He saved you, because He saved you when you trusted Him. But if you're in this room and you've never made a decision for Jesus Christ, you're sitting here and you're lost with God's judgment and wrath hanging over your life, I have to warn you, as a preacher of the Bible, that time will run out. The day will come when you will have no more opportunities to say yes to God. Do not keep putting God off. And the same for believers. Don't keep putting Him off if He's telling you to do something, if He's telling you to get your life right if He's telling you to answer His call for your life, don't keep putting Him off. Because that call may stop. That prompting in your heart may stop. If you're in this room and you need to be saved, 
I want you to go to God and do business with Him today. If you need to talk to someone after service about making a decision for Jesus Christ, I want you to know that I'll be available and other people here will be available. But if God's speaking to your heart about something, about salvation or about your relationship with Him, when they start playing the music, I want to invite you to step out into the aisle and come down and and kneel on the front pew or on the steps and do business with God today. And there'll be brothers and sisters here who will watch and be able to pray with you. I want you to stand to your feet. And as we play, as soon as the first words are sung, I want you to respond to what God's telling you today.